More than 20 years ago, my career began here. Not as an astronaut, and not in space per se, but in aerospace engineering. Even before I went off to college after graduating high school, I started working for a Long Island-based aerospace company that designed, tested, and built electronic sensors for satellites, rockets, and other aerospace applications. I went to Cornell University to study aerospace engineering, and while I was there, became a Lockheed Martin engineering scholar. You could say that my career trajectory was all systems go, until it wasn't. Along the way, I developed a deep crisis of purpose. Suddenly, aerospace didn't feel like my life's calling. But what was? After a thorough bit of soul searching, one thing especially resonated, environmental sustainability. I knew what I had to do, abandon aerospace and instead pursue a degree in natural resource management. And I remember walking into the office of my faculty advisor at Cornell to lay out this plan. I don't think I'll ever forget his advice, which I promptly ignored. He looked at me and flatly said, I just want you to know, you're leaving the money to go hug trees. That was enough for me. I walked out of his office and didn't look back. In that moment, my career went from mission control to mission driven. And the mission was sustainability. Since then, I've dedicated my professional life to the environment. My career has focused on various topics, wildlife, water, land use planning. But I've spent the longest and the most recent chapter of my career focused on the clean energy revolution. Why? Because of the global climate crisis. The climate crisis is unique among environmental causes because its impacts are so far reaching. Conflicts over water scarcity, the severity of natural disasters ranging from flooding to wildfires, food insecurity, biodiversity loss, heat related deaths in vulnerable populations. Climate change has a finger in every one of those pots. And here on Long Island, we have felt the foretaste of its effects and our vulnerability to it. Like when Superstorm Sandy devastated the coastline and knocked out power on the island. In the case of my childhood home here in Farmingdale, for 15 days. Or this summer's deadly heat wave, the hottest June and July on record globally. When temperatures in places like Paris and elsewhere throughout Northern Europe, where air conditioning is rare, soared to a staggering 109 degrees Fahrenheit. We know that the single biggest driver of the climate crisis is our burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, and we burn a lot of it. We burn coal and natural gas to generate much of our electricity. We burn oil in the form of gasoline and diesel to fuel our cars and trucks. And we burn yet more natural gas to heat our homes and offices in winter, heat our water, and often cook our dinner. It can feel daunting, even paralyzing, to tackle such a problem of that magnitude. So how do we make hope possible, not despair convincing? to quote Welsh academic Raymond Williams. And not just plain old hope, but rather the idea of applied hope. Applied hope is a term coined by Amory Lovins. Amory was co-founder and chief scientist at Rocky Mountain Institute, a clean energy think tank where I worked earlier in my career. Amory describes applied hope in this way. He says, applied hope is not mere optimism. That's because the optimist treats the future as fate, not choice. On the other hand, the person living in hope has her sleeves rolled up and is fighting hard to change or beat the odds. That's an empowering message. This idea of living in applied hope starts with changing what we perceive to be possible and then behaving differently as a result. And so with that in mind, my key message to you is that the clean energy revolution has already won, full stop. If we can make that mental shift, we can start acting differently today to affect the climate outcome. But it's a pretty bold claim, so allow me to explain. Buckminster Fuller was an American architect, inventor, and futurist. And he famously said that you never change things by fighting against the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. Throughout history, we've seen time and again the power of inflection points. They might be technological, or societal, or economic. But what strikes me most is the speed with which markets can fundamentally transform, the speed with which the old model can become obsolete. The trick is to see when these inflection points are coming 
and to rightly identify when we are in the midst of one. Which brings to mind another quote, this one attributed to Henry Ford, who said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said, faster horses. Gives me a great segue into this idea of inflection points and obsolescence, and in this case, a view of early 1900s New York City. We're looking here at side-by-side -side images of Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, photographs taken on the same day, just 13 years apart, in 1900 and 1913. On the left in 1900, you can see that the avenue is choked with horse-drawn carriages. And if you look carefully, you can spot the first automobile coming onto the scene. There it is. Less than a decade later, the horse-drawn carriages have all but vanished, replaced almost entirely by the automobile. Even still, there's a lonely horse still hanging on to the old way. And so it's an early testament to just how rapidly a market can overturn. Let's look at one more recent example. In the late 1990s, analog cameras had basically 100% market share. Many of you will remember that these are the kind of cameras that you had to actually load with film, take your photographs, take the film to get developed, and receive physical prints that you would put into a physical photo album, very late 20th century. But by 1999, digital cameras had come onto the scene. Even so, if we were to look only at 1999 as an isolated snapshot, we might be tempted to say that analog cameras were still the ruling party with an overwhelming majority, 85% market share. Of course, with the benefit of hindsight, we know that 1999 was an inflection point in the camera market. In less than a decade, digital cameras went from a new technology to essentially 100% market share. And on the flip side, analog cameras went from the only game in town to more or less extinct. So what I'm saying to you then is that the clean energy revolution today is what digital cameras were in 1999 and what the automobile was in the early 1900s. If we look only narrowly, it might appear to be the little guy. But if we can pull back and widen our view, if we can observe the disruptive trends that are sweeping through the global energy sector and take out our crystal ball, we can see that clean energy is in the midst of an unstoppable inflection point. I liken it to the story of the tortoise and the hare, only the roles are reversed. Of course, in the traditional version of the allegory, it's the hare who breaks out to the early lead, only to be overtaken by the slow and steady tortoise. In my energy version of this story, it's the fossil fuel industry who is the tortoise, and they're out ahead in the lead, moving along slow and steady, with about a 100-year head start. The clean energy sector is the hare, we may have started late, but we are catching up with lightning speed and poised to dominantly overtake the tortoise. And so how can I be so confident that the clean energy revolution has in fact won? Well, there are multiple complementary megatrends sweeping not just through New York or even the United States, but around the world. And today I'd like to take a look at two of them. The first is electrification. And there's no better example than the transition from gasoline burning cars to electric vehicles like the Tesla, Nissan Leaf, Chevy Bolt, and a fast growing list of others. And trend number two is decarbonization. Once we shift our energy demand onto electricity, make that electricity as clean as possible through renewables like solar and wind. So first, let's take a closer look at electric vehicles. From a climate and an emissions perspective, EVs are pretty incredible. For starters, their powertrains are hyper-efficient. If they ran on gasoline, they would get the equivalent of more than 100 miles per gallon. Of course, they don't run on gasoline, they're electric, so they have no tailpipe emissions. And as our power grid gets cleaner and cleaner with renewable energy, the electric vehicles that we charge on that grid get cleaner too. At the end of last year, there were already more than 1 million electric vehicles on the roads in the United States. I drive one of them. By 2030, just a decade away from today, that number is expected to balloon to 19 million. And it wouldn't surprise me if that number creeps even higher. Actual electric vehicle adoption has been consistently outpacing the market forecasts. And what's most exciting is the global view out to 2040. By then, we expect more than half of all new, ve new vehicle sales worldwide to be electric vehicles. Stop and think about that for just a moment. The average American drives their car for about seven years. And the typical automobile stays on the road for a total of about 11 years. That means that the year 2040, even though it may sound distant, 
is just two to three cars away from today. Look around this room and consider that. A couple of cars from now, most of you will probably be driving electric vehicles. Second, let's take a look at decarbonization and the surge in renewable energy. Here in the United States, in the mid-2000s, our installed base of wind power started to really take off. Then earlier in this decade, solar energy also started to take off. In fact, solar is now growing the fastest and is poised to become the world's leading source of electricity. And again, what's most exciting to me is the global view. By 2050, which is generally accepted as the international deadline for taking decisive action in the climate crisis, renewable energy, including solar, wind, and hydro, are on track to generate up to 80% of the world's electricity. That is a tectonic shift from where we are today. Everywhere we look, there's mounting evidence that renewables are the future, and increasingly, that future is now. All we have to do is look at the growing list of countries, states, cities, Fortune 500s, all of them setting 100% renewable energy targets. Some of them are already there, and many of them are getting close. In fact, among major U.S. cities, do you know who ranks number one in renewable energy with 92%? It's Houston, Texas, arguably the oil and gas capital of the country. And perhaps most poignantly, earlier just this summer, the London Stock Exchange reclassified oil and gas stocks as non-renewables. This entirely reframes the conversation. It makes renewable energy the default, the status quo, the defining metric. And it redefines fossil fuels as the other. We are in the midst of a massive tipping point in the clean energy revolution. It's like being a travel agent at the time when websites like Expedia and Travelocity were first coming onto the scene. Do you maintain business as usual and wait to see how things unfold? Or do you see the writing on the wall and start doing some things differently today to prepare for the inevitable change that you see coming? Believe me, I understand that it's a pretty risky thing for me to stand up here and tell you that the renewable energy and the clean energy revolution has already won. Because the worst thing that could happen is that you get complacent, sit back, and do nothing as a result of what I'm saying. There are still three very important variables in play. How soon does clean energy win? Where does it win first? And by what margin? And the decisions that we collectively take and the actions that we take from this day forward can materially influence the outcome to those three questions. And so it's time that each and every one of us starts acting like clean energy is the winning team. Because it is. It's time to stop questioning if it can win. It's time to, time to stop waiting and see what happens next. Instead, it's time to roll up our sleeves and start using some applied hope. Now, author Malcolm Gladwell writes, that as a tipping point is that magical moment when an idea, trend, or social behavior crosses a threshold, tips, and spreads like wildfire. Well, the clean energy revolution is tipping. We are in the barrel going over the lip of Niagara Falls. There's no turning back. And that's a good thing. Because the reality is clean energy can win. In fact, it already has. You just have to go out there and make me right. Thank you.